My name is Jay Abravich. Um, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. My story started um, three years ago when I was 36 years old. Um, I was a healthy, active, very typical 36 year old adult. Um, I was kind of in the prime of my life, um, you know, like happily married, I work was going well. I first kind of ventured into this whole journey when I started getting some very minor um, abdominal kind of cramps and pains I've never kind of really felt before. Kind of just, to be honest, like thought it was stress. Didn't really think anything of it. But then um, my second kind of big red flag symptom uh, was I started to have a little bit of blood in my stool. It was not major. Like it was very, very minor. Um, very, very easily could have been passed off. Um, for just hemorrhoids or, you know, inflammation in the intestine somewhere, an infection in my GI tract. Uh, but when I was Googling stuff, um, and I did, you know, like abdominal cramps, um, <clears throat> blood in the stool, obviously I kind of kept, so I kept seeing colon cancer come up. So I really, it wasn't on my radar, to be honest with you. Um, but the fact that that was there got me obviously thinking about it. I think my early on symptoms I don't think were very typical that you often hear like I it wasn't a case where I was in like debilitating pain or ended up in the ER needing emergency surgery like it was not like that at all um to be honest like looking back and my doctors were even said like they don't even necessarily know if that had anything to do with the colon cancer because it was so mild um it was just it was very much just more of like a nuisance. It kind of felt like it was just more, you know, a little bit of pressure here and there. Um, the odd kind of like, uh, the odd almost like spasm sensation. Um, it came and went. There was nothing persistent. Um, there was nothing that really affected me um, dramatically. Like it was almost, again, like I said, like it wasn't something that really concerned me. Um, it was... It was basically the blood in the stool that really got me thinking there was something more going on. Um, and really the size of my tumor and where it was because it was in my sigmoid colon. Um, and it was quite small. It was only about it was only about two by three and a half centimeters. So there was nothing to like, again, like my doctors really don't believe that a lot of that pain even had anything to do with that. Like I said, like at the time of my diagnosis, like I did have a very physical job. I was running, working out all the time. Um, so really it could have been anything. <laughs> so I'd gone to see my GP and um, my GP is awesome. We have a great rapport. You know, she, she really kind of has my back and has always taken really good care of me. Um, the day I went in for the appointment, it happened to be clinic day and that's when they have students um or residents kind of working with the doctors you know that's i guess part of their med school so i got to meet one of our residents um really young guy i think we were probably around the same age to be honest with you um kind of did all that stuff that i was expecting you know he did like a generally asked all the questions about you know how long the symptoms have been lasting um are they impacting you know like your bowel movements are they impacting your movements are you eating are you you know like just the general stuff that when you go to the doctor they kind of just do their due diligence um because of the blood he did a rectal exam um a digital rectal exam sorry and he didn't really find anything like there was nothing that he felt there was nothing kind of odd so he basically just kind of left it as it can potentially be an infection it could potentially be you know, inflammation in your GI somewhere from a hundred different things. Uh, you know, hemorrhoids, of course, came up, stress, all like all that typical stuff you hear when you have kind of things going on in your stomach. Um, but I kind of pushed back a little bit because I was quite concerned that I kept seeing colon cancer come up every time that I Googled stuff. So I think the one part of that visit that, you know, I really always try to highlight um, was like, he looked right at me and basically said, you know, like, Mr. Abramovich, you're 36, you're healthy. You know, this is not cancer. And, you know, that was at the time that was really reassuring because, of course, everything I've Googled and like I had this whole big like I was going to be rushed away to the hospital that day and all these things were going to happen. Um, but when he kind of said that, it was a huge weight off. But then luckily, I still got to see my actual GP afterwards. And, you know, she 
she was honest. Like she did say that it's very unlikely, you know, like she never dismissed me. She didn't dismiss my concerns, but I mean, unlikely that a 36 healthy adult was sitting in front of her with colon cancer. Right. So, and that was, that's fair. Like that was a fair kind of assessment. However, um, she's quite diligent and she'd asked me if I wanted to have a referral for a colonoscopy. And I said, absolutely. (laughs) That's what I was hoping to get out of the appointments. Two weeks later, I, you know, got a diagnosis. So, yeah, I think the scary thing for me in that whole, I, like that whole situation was like, how many other patients did he maybe say something like that to? Or how many other residents out there that are these new doctors? Like, this was not an old doctor. Like, this was a brand new doctor that just went to medical school, still thinking that young adults can't get this disease. And it's just really, I don't know, it's just kind of disheartening that that message hasn't really hit home yet in like medical school. And it's real that hasn't come down the pipes that it could happen to anybody. <laughs> Colonoscopies is they're not scary at all. Um, it was actually a pretty smooth, painless um, kind of thing. Like, would I rather have not have to do them? Absolutely. Um, but at this point in my journey, I've had about three or four of them at this point. And um to be honest, the worst part is the, I shouldn't even say the worst part, the most uncomfortable part is the prep because yeah, you have to clean out your bowels and drink a whole bunch of solution, you know, a whole bunch of liquid that probably about four liters of liquid that doesn't, you know, taste very good. And there's a couple of days of prep that yeah, aren't the funnest, but at the same time, um, it's really not that bad when you actually go get the procedure done. Um, you're comfortable. I, I personally didn't feel a thing. The staff were great. Um, I know in my hospital, uh, they give you the choice to, you know, be awake or be totally out um, based on kind of your comfort level. And the whole procedure lasted about 25 minutes. And in my situation, it was actually, I found it actually really neat and almost empowering a little bit because I had asked to stay awake and my surgeon was actually the one doing the colonoscopy. And she showed me my tumor, like the camera was inside me and I was able to look at it. And she was explaining, you know, she kind of took a moment to explain where it was exactly in me and kind of give me a little bit of like a reference to what was going on, um, which I thought was kind of cool because you never really get that perspective. You just kind of get it on a report on paper. So I don't know. I found it like, I think it went really smooth for me. They're not scary at all. Um, I think you know, that type of procedure for something that could save someone's life or really, you know, make a drastic difference in an outcome. Um, to me, it's a no brainer. So I presented at the hospital. Um, they, again, like I was looked at as a 36 year old healthy adult, um, you know, but they really, they did a physical exam. My blood work came back perfect. My CEA was like 1.8. Um, it's never changed. It's always stayed at that. Um, so they were leaning towards like diverticulitis, stress, inflammation, like all the stuff that, you know, before they would consider a cancer because of my age, essentially, and my health. Um, luckily, I again, like I keep saying luckily, but I've had a lot of really great medical people that have kind of crossed my path. And this ER physician um, made the decision to do imaging. He wanted to do a CT scan. Um, just to confirm that, you know, just to confirm what his thoughts were, because you don't want to give me uh, antibiotics unnecessarily. So I came back the next day, and I did the CT. About an hour later, um, he popped his head out from, you know, the back, the like from the way to the bays and all that, and he called my name. Um, I knew right away something was wrong, um, just from, you know, working in emergency services and what i I know people's demeanors and I know kind of, I know that whole process of giving someone some bad news. So I kind of just knew right away that something was up when he called me back Um, as I was just expecting a prescription and a, you know, good luck to you if it's still, you know, if it's still persistent, kind of go see your GP again. Uh, But obviously that's not what happened that day. So he, um, he taken me back um, to a private little room and he sat down on the tape on the, uh, sorry, on the, bed right next to me and he showed me a piece of paper which was my ct report and said unfortunately they found a mass um in my colon 
and they also see they also saw some lymph nodes that were enlarged kind of regionally in that area so um i was in complete shock um completely not expecting it um especially after seeing like my gp the er physician like they were all very in line with like a few very staple kind of you know things that were going on uh, but this was the complete opposite of what anybody thought that was going on and the rest of that day was a blur like i was again like i was fortunate that my gp had a lot of connections at that hospital i got a really quick emergency procedure done to do a sigmoidoscopy and get a um, biopsy done and basically when i woke up from that um the general surgeon he basically was very open with me that you know he was like 99 percent sure that we were looking at cancer um i of course was kind of like just coming out of sedation so you know it, of course like it didn't really hit i guess like how it necessarily would if i wasn't but luckily my wife was there you know we went home that night we were both in shock um we really didn't know what to say what to do um yeah, we had about a five day wait um, to get that biopsy result back. And uh, we both kind of made the decision to work, um, keep things as normal as possible, and just kind of go through the week, um, just do our thing, right? Like try not to have everything kind of stop and just stew and sit around and think and wait because that wasn't going to make anything easier in that, like at that time. So uh, yeah, so that Friday, I got a call in the parking lot at work um, when I was leaving, and it was the general surgeon with the biopsy results, um, and he confirmed that it was, in fact, cancer, and that he was sending all of my files immediately over to the Ottawa Cancer Center, and that I'd be hearing from them at some point early, like early the following week. But basically what happened from that point is I got all my stuff got sent to the Ottawa hospital. The following week after the biopsy confirmation, I heard from the colorectal surgeon's office um, in Ottawa and they kind of reviewed everything. And because the tumor was quite small, they were going to, they decided to do surgery up front uh, because at that point they weren't sure if those lymph nodes they were seeing were actually involved, if they were just like, you know, they, they couldn't confirm that at that point. Uh, but what they did know is the tumor was quite small and it was in a place that, <clears throat> sorry, it was in a place that they could definitely reach very easily um, and kind of take a few inches of my large intestines out and then reconnect everything. So following that, the early January, I actually had a full colonoscopy just so they could go in and take a look and actually tattoo the tumors because that's how they locate it when they do the surgery, the surgery laparoscopically. And they also wanted to check the rest of my colon and everything. And everything was clear. It was great. Um, there was no other areas of concern at all. So I was scheduled for surgery. And on February February 19th, um, I had my resection done. And um, it went off smoothly. There was no issues. The surgery, I believe, was about three and a half hours. Um, they were able to do it laparoscopically, so minimally invasive, which was great. Um, they ended up taking, I believe, if I recall about six, six or seven inches, um, of my large intestines out and they were able to reconnect the plumbing as my surgeon called it. And, um, you know, and one of the, one of the things I was really worried about was like, oh, am I going to wake up with an ostomy? Am I going to wake up with like, you know, like what's going to happen? Are they going to be able to reconnect everything? So that was kind of a big relief for me. Um, I know that was kind of, it was it's kind of silly, but like out of everything, for some reason, that was like the big stressor for me about that surgery, um, which in retrospect, it's probably the least, <laughs> you know, like it's, you know, like that can go wrong in a surgery. So, you know, I was really happy about that. And then um, was kind of another wait at that point because they were expecting like those hospital stays are normally four to seven days, kind of depending on what happens. Um, I was super lucky. I got out in three um, just because, you know, the surgeons were happy. I went in really strong. I was healthy. I was up walking like the next day. Um, the pain wasn't too, too bad. Like they had to, you know, I was off, I was off the actual pain med the next day. Um, I was kind of switched to tight, like Tylenol threes. They sent me home with a bit of codeine. I think I used it once and beyond that was just Tylenol. Um, 
you know, my surgeon was really adamant that because like I was in good shape and I really like I worked out going into the surgery and I really kind of prepped myself for it. Um, that really helped the recovery as well. And then was kind of another weight for pathology because they took out the tumor, but they also took out about 20, I think it was 24 or 25 lymph nodes that had to get sent for pathology. And that was about a four week wait um, for all that to come back. I was really active during my recovery. Um, there were definitely some days that were more difficult. Like some days, you know, the pain was a little more like, I definitely remember like the first couple of weeks, especially were really, really frustrating because I'm really active and, you know, I'm, I'm independent. I work out, I run, like I, I weight lift. I like for like six weeks, like I couldn't even lift the laundry basket. Right. Like I, like we went to do groceries and I was able to carry in like a melon or like one like item at a time. Right. Like I remember taking like handfuls of like handfuls of laundry, like little scoops downstairs, like one at a time, just to like, you know, be able to do something and help out. Um, so mentally that was quite challenging. Uh, I'm not going to lie, like going from, you know, being strong, healthy, independent, like not dependent on anybody um, and helping others based on what I've always done, like professionally to suddenly being like, Hey, freeze time out. You can't do anything for yourself right now. You need everybody else to kind of do it for you. Um, was really tough. Like that, that was a really, really tough part of everything. Um, but I got through it. Like I, I had a lot of support. Um, my family was great. Um, during all that time, I kind of, you know, I found some really great social, um, like social and emotional support groups that really, really helped me during that time, um, which were key players, you know, like getting onto some like zoom calls and talking to other patients and making those kind of peer connections, um, definitely made that recovery, a lot easier. So while well, we got the pathology back and um, unfortunately um, it did show that there was cancer cells in seven out of the 25 lymph nodes that they had removed. So that basically took me from a stage one or two that they thought to a stage three B, um, which was a pretty big jump. Like I was not expecting that. So, I mean, in retrospect, like it still has really great odds and like, it's still a very manageable stage and there's, you know, it's quite successful. So it was still a shock to kind of hear that, but it was also more of a shock because I knew that meant chemo like that, that, that pathology made the difference between like everything being over after that surgery, um, or having a whole other kind of adventure in this situation. Right. So, um, that basically came back as, yeah, the diagnosis was stage three B colon cancer. Um, and after recovery, I was basically lined up for six months of Volfox. I did 12 treatments. I tolerated it quite well, to be honest. Like I was definitely lucky in that regard. I was, I worked all the way through my treatments. I was quite active. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it was, they, they took great care of me. Like it, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like there were days I felt like crap. So I ended up, uh, I got through the 12, I got through the 12 cycles with very, like with no incidents. I kind of sailed through it, um, did my thing. I did chemo from April till September um, 23rd was my last one of 2021. And yeah, after that, uh, I was, I was net essentially. I was kind of graduated to surveillance and that was supposed to be the end of it really. <laughs> so like, like I do say I got off very lucky. My body just took to it very well. Uh, fortunately, the major side effects that I really had were fatigue. Um, I had quite a bit of fatigue. Um, my skin was not happy. Like I have sensitive skin as it is, but it definitely did a number on my skin with like rashes and um, just dryness and cracking. Like I had a pretty rough time with that at some points. Um, uh, the neuropathy was not fun. Anyone that's done full Fox knows like from the oxaloplatin, um, that neuropathy can get pretty nasty. Uh, but I, I did a lot to counter it. Like it really wasn't all that bad for me. I did deal with it, but it wasn't too, too bad. Um, you know, to combat that, I was working with a naturopath. I was taking a lot of supplements. I was doing acupuncture, uh, reflex, like reflexology, massage. I was, you know, like doing all kinds of alternative stuff as well. And also in, in my cancer center, anyway, I was one of the first people to do icing. So I was icing my hands and my feet, every infusion of Folfox. 
so I'm not a doctor. I don't know like the like the detailed science behind it, but essentially what it's supposed to do is help with the cold sensitivity um, because like it it restricts blood flow to your extremities, right? When you put cold, it's like, you know, like it shrinks your veins and your arteries down so you don't get as much blood flow in that area. So I guess the theory is, is not as much chemo gets to your hands and feet. Um, so it lessens the cold sensitivity effects. Um, so for example, like, I have videos that I was that I, I was t- I would take videos like I'd get home and put my hands right in the freezer and like pick up frozen food and be totally okay and other patients that don't do like that didn't do that like you couldn't even touch like a cold cup like you get shocks and it would be like extremely painful so it was like a huge huge like even quality of life thing right so I had my last chemo on September 23rd I rang the bell, I had a nice big celebration, I hugged all the nurses there. And the plan basically after that was a couple months after that, I was going to get a follow-up scan just to get a baseline, like a post-chemo baseline, essentially. Uh, And that scan came back clean. So I was essentially, at that point, I was graduated to surveillance. Um, I was declared NED. And it basically stayed that way for about 15 or 16 months. Of course, I was in scans every three months and that was good for uh, the first year. And then I got graduated to six months and I had one six month scan that was clean. And then this past September um, on one of my surveillance scans, unfortunately, the lung nodule popped up. So um, we went back and it was actually on a scan a year ago. It was just tiny and it just wasn't like, a lot of times stuff in the lungs is just not noted until it really changes because a lot of us have some on our lungs that are absolutely nothing. So it has, it did change over the last year um, gradually. So um, this September, I found that out, which was a bit of a shock. Um, I've been completely asymptomatic. Like I've been feeling pretty good. Um, I'm, I was essentially, I think I'm in better shape and feeling better than I was before my diagnosis really. Um, which is awesome, but also a little kind of confusing because how could like a reoccurrence happen when you're feeling great? Like, it's just one of those things where you don't like, I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel any difference. I was really feeling great. Um, If it wasn't for that scan, I wouldn't have a clue, right? Like I would not have a clue anything was there. So that kind of thrusted me back into like patient mode really quickly, which was really challenging because I've spent the last... 18 months, like almost two years trying to figure out how not to be a patient anymore. And I think I was like, get, I was in a really good spot. Yeah, this kind of hit. So luckily I had a lot of options. It was an isolated kind of incident. There was no spread anywhere else. We ended up deciding to do some SBRT um, as opposed to surgery right now. So I had three sessions of 15 minutes um, of SBRT on that area, which was done in November. So I'm kind of just recovering from that now. I had very, very like no side effects at all, really. It was quite amazing. Um, So it's, I don't know, I'm not going to say the acronym because I'm going to butcher it and I'm not a doctor, but essentially it's a very, it's a very specialized and precise um, radiation. So as opposed to like radiation, let's say doing like a whole area of the body and a whole bunch of tissue gets affected, they actually map out like a, like almost to like the millimeter just so the like just so the radiation is actually impacting only the tumor and like very minimal surrounding tissue around it um to be honest it had it i had very little side effects i had a little bit of fatigue um immediately after each session technically speaking <laughs> i am back at med if everything if the sbrt did what it was supposed to do there was another little tiny nodule that popped up that they were watching but it did not light up on my PET scan that I did. So um, they're not sold that that's anything at all. Um, So we're just kind of, they're going to keep a close eye on it. Um, Next set of scans, see if anything changes. Um, If it does, my oncologist or my radiation oncologist has already told me he will treat it with SBRT right away, no problem. Um, So I'm kind of, you know, if it does turn into something at at some point, I got a plan, I'm good. Um, I know SBRT is pain, like it's highly effective. It's very minimally invasive. So I'm happy about that. 
Um, <clears throat> I guess my next scans are in January. So those are going to be big ones. Uh, my uncle, everybody gave me the holidays off. They were like, you know what, like SBRT takes some time to work. So let's push the scans back a couple of weeks. Um, you know, nobody needs it. Like take the holidays off, enjoy the holidays with your family. You don't, you don't need like test results hanging over your head. So we are going to scan in the second week of January and basically see, ensure that the SBRT did what it was supposed to do. And, you know, knock on wood, it's shrunk, it's dead, it's stable, whatever, um, whatever they need to see. Um, if it did grow at all, um, I do have the option of doing another round of SBRT on it. So I do have a lot of options. Um, my situation is very good. Like, I know I'm fortunate. Like, it's not a, you know, I, I'm right on the brink of being that again and staying there for a long time, if not forever this time. Um, you know, I am a little bit nervous for that appointment because I don't know if my oncologist is going to, you know, suggest, oh, let's do some cleanup chemo just to be sure. Um, let's just watch and wait. So I'm kind of like, because with my situation, it's fairly unique because it was a very, it was one isolated mat, right? Um, I guess what I didn't mention as well, it kind of adds a little bit of a layer to it is that we didn't do a biopsy on it because, um, we deemed or I felt that the risks of that lung biopsy were not necessarily worth it for one isolated met, um, especially given that it lit up on the PET scan. So the fact that it lit up on the PET scan was enough for me. I know our systems are very different in the States and Canada. Like, so I know second opinions and all that like work very differently, but I think at the core of it, advocacy is advocacy. And, you know, my biggest suggestion and the biggest lesson that I've learned is yes, you have to trust your doctors. They are the doctors, they're the pros, but you also have the right to question them, right? In a polite, professional, appropriate way, you're allowed to ask questions, right? You're allowed to ask them why they're making the decisions they're making and, you know, why not? And, you know, you're allowed to give them ideas, right? Like do your research, right? Talk to organizations, like there's great organizations out there, you know, get a network built around you and don't hesitate and don't be scared to like say something you don't understand or something you don't agree with, or, you know, you got an idea from somebody or you heard of a study or a new treatment or what have you, like, don't think that bringing that to your team is going to hurt their feelings or it's going to like insult anybody um, or what have you. Like at the end of the day, it's your body. And it's your outcome, right? Like those doctors, they're amazing. Absolutely. Like I love my team. Um, I know there's a very mixed bag of types of oncologists and doctors and people have very different experiences. But at the end of the day, um, they are not the end all be all, right? Like they, they help you, they quarterback you, but their word is not the final say and it's not always the right one, right? And I've kind of learned that sometimes bringing things to them when you learn how to work with them and actually be part of your care, they actually take your opinions and they'll actually take some of your ideas and make things happen. Right. So instead of kind of just being a pawn and like the doctor says, jump, you say how high, right? Like be a part of your care. Like when there's meetings and there's decisions to be made, like be part of that, you know, be actively engaged in that and make your voice heard because if they know you're going to cause a ruckus and you're going to speak up and you're going to, you know, make phone calls and send emails and you're going to, you know, stir up the pot essentially to get things done, they will work that much harder for you because they know you're invested and they know that you're not going to wait. Like if they lag or if they say no, you're going to find a way. 